Reporting in progress. Typically, there are around 10,000 agents working in the FBI at any given period, but there's only one lead international kidnapping negotiator, and that is our guest today. His name is Chris Voss, and prior to 2008, Chris led kidnapping negotiations all around the world for the United States FBI. On top of that, Chris was the hostage negotiation representative for the National Security Council's Hostage Working Group. During his government career, he also represented the U.S. at two international conferences sponsored by the G8 as an expert in kidnapping. Prior to becoming the FBI's lead kidnapping negotiator, Chris served as the lead crisis negotiator for the New York City's division of the FBI, and he has been a member of the city's Joint Terrorist Task Force for 14 years. After his 24-year tenure at the FBI, Chris founded the Black Swan Group with his son Brandon, helping corporations and businesses all around the world get the most optimal results at the negotiating table. And he's on the podcast today. Chris, I'm honored to have you. How are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And uh, I just heard that you're in Las Vegas where we just came from a retreat and a couple people on the call came as well where we decided to do aerial dogfighting uh, as a fun, fun, fun activity. But um, about half of us ended up vomiting multiple times and, and <laughs> almost all of us passed out. So <laughs> if you if you need some extreme activities for friends in Vegas, I recommend it. Uh, that sounds great. Yeah. Vomiting <laughs> and passing out. <laughs> It sounds like a Vegas activity. It sounds like, I mean, that's what most people do in Las Vegas, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so glad to have you on the show. Um, we had your son on the show uh, quite a while ago and learned a lot from Brandon and um, made a really good podcast out of it. I love negotiating. I've been a student of negotiations and psychology for years, just like a side little hobby habit. And um, read your book, Never Split the Difference. It is kind of now the go-to book. Um, I'm in Mexico at the moment, and I was at a, a meetup with some friends, and I told them, I, I mentioned the name Chris Voss, and everybody got excited. They said, oh, he wrote Never Split the Difference. And um, it's a really, really uh, educational book. And I, I want to ask you, um, when did you know you were passionate about a negotiating? And when did you realize that you could do this on the scale that you have? Yeah, well, uh, a couple questions, and, I, and I'm going to address a point that you made up earlier because you said that you had Brandon on the show, and, and Brandon is really young credited co-author. Yes. The contract was with me, but uh, the book wouldn't have come out if it hadn't been for his help. So when, when did I find out that I was passionate about negotiation? Yeah. You know, I always thought it was kind of cool. I, I look back at my history. I, I think I, I, uh, I, the first negotiating book I may have ever bought, I may, was probably either when I was still in college or right after college. Uh, Herb Cohen's You Can Negotiate Anything. Now, I don't know that, I, in no way that I ever envisioned I would end up being an FBI hostage negotiator um, some years later. But the process of getting on the negotiation team when I was volunteered on a crisis hotline in New York City, like that was cool. The ability to really help people change the direction of what they were doing just by words. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was really cool. And I really, really enjoyed that a lot. And then it's, you know, continued to be really fun, satisfying ever since. Was there a point, Chris, where you, you realized I'm going to be really good at this and I'm going to have a really awesome career at this. Now, I don't know that I ever realized that. I okay. just knew that I enjoyed it. Okay. And because it was so intriguing and, you know, you can cr create these great moments. And I really enjoyed creating those moments. And, you know, you create them on the hotline and you go like, wow, is it, this is crazy. Can, is this going to work in normal life? And then it does. And, um, you know, and creating a great moment with people instead of against them. And so, you know, being good at something is really an ongoing process. Negotiation is a perishable skill. Okay. So I suppose if you think you're good at it or you've arrived, maybe you're going to stop paying attention to it. Uh, and, and then your skills are going to diminish. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's an ongoing learning journey. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, an important, I think, business tactic that you kind of applied early in your career 
uh, that many other entrepreneurs I know that have done. Um, and I think maybe at the time you didn't even realize you were doing it, but one of your supervisors recommended that you went uh, and volunteered at the suicide hotline, I believe. Right. And yeah. you actually took their advice and they were surprised that you took their advice, but it showed right. that you were serious about it. And in business, when people go volunteer to as an intern or as an apprentice for a couple of years, we have a, uh, I have a good friend that did that for Stephen Kotler. And, um, within a couple of years, he's a smart dude. I really yeah. Like yeah. And, uh, so when he did that after a couple of years, Stephen took him on as a, as a co-owner in the company. And so, um, what made you decide way back in the day to take your supervisor, supervisor serious and go, go volunteer at the suicide hotline? You know, that's a good question because that ends up being a really, that's a, that's a black swan thing to do. The little thing that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And I just took it for granted. Like, and I had no idea how unusual that was. I mean, I, and I look at a couple of moments over my career, it, it, that sort of thing had a pivotal, was pivotal in me becoming an FBI agent at all. Like, I just figured, you know, you want to do something, you ask somebody who should be able to tell you. And then you follow their advice. It, it isn't any more complicated that, than that. And nobody does it. It's yeah. so stupid. I think the first issue maybe is they're not asking the right people. You know, there's a phrase, never take advice from somebody you wouldn't trade places with. or never take direction on how to get somewhere from someone who's never been there. Um, you know, that's inherent in who you're asking for advice. But then, then you got to follow it. And that just seemed to me to be a really obvious move. And I've since come to find out that it's so unusual that that in and of itself creates life changing moments. Yeah. And it definitely did for you. Um, yeah. Some of the advice I got when I was an early entrepreneur um, was a, from a former mentor of mine. And he said, Chris, when a millionaire talks, shut up and listen. And <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was some really good advice. Um, and it makes sense. Uh, okay, so let's dive into um, maybe some stories, and then we'll move into some practical tactics that you highlight in the book that I think the listeners can take as take take away as like easy takeaways that they can apply in their lives on a regular basis. Um, but before we get there, I, I want to ask you, um, what was the most, I guess, intense? international negotiation experience for you where you were the most scared yourself of the situation? Yeah, well, scared, scared's a broad term. Um, first of all, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about scared for my own physical safety, which um, I believe in calculated risks. So as long as I know what the risks are going in, like I'm, I'm willing to take chances. Um, scared for scared. the hostage, you know, the, uh, yeah. what may unfold from the situation? Well, in a uh, 2004 ish time frame, um, you know, Al Qaeda was in the murder people on camera business. Okay. And they made it look like kidnappings. And so to properly work a kidnapping, the best avenues of influence is, is you coach family members, family or friends. And it, what was hard was like, you, you got a pretty good idea in advance how this is going to go down. You can see a train wreck on its way. Now your, your job is to try to get out of the way or minimize its impact or minimize its collateral damage. And sometimes the, the best you could hope for is minimizing the collateral damage. What does that mean? It means there's a really good chance that their kidnapped victim's dead one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so then to get family members to cooperate with you, when basically you had to be honest with them and, and not promise them something that was never going to happen. And that was the 2004 time frame. You know, um, uh, ISIS, um, you know, the son of Al Qaeda, repeated the same process in the 2012 time frame. Mm-hmm. But when we when we got engaged in the 2004 ish time frame, I mean, that was ugly because you had to be honest with family members. They'd say, if I follow your advice, if I say the things in the media that you want me to say, is that going to save my brother? Is that going to save my husband? And you can't lie to them. 
And in point of fact, they knew things looked really bad. They really wanted to find out if you were going to lie to them. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was a hard time for him. And I was, I was always honest with people as gently as I could be. And I literally had, um, Paul Johnson's boss asked me that question point blank. If, cause I was trying to coach his Paul Johnson's wife, widow to be, and he said, is this going to make a difference? And I said, this might not be within reach. And he said, I didn't think so. I just want to see if you're going to lie to me. Oh, wow. Wow. So that was, that was tough on, you know, but yeah, tough on me. I didn't lose anybody. Yeah. And how my do you, family. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you handle that when you go home after the job's done for the day? I mean, how do you, how do you manage your own sanity when going through an experience like that? Yeah. You know, I, um, is, is a beauty to that question. Um, and I didn't realize that I was intentionally engaging in anti-fragile behavior. Uh, you know, the, my company, the Black Swan Group, um, we derived the name from uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's 2007 book, The Black Swan. Right. What are the little things that make all the difference in the world? And then the Black Swan method, you know, how do you negotiate in a way that it makes all the difference in the world? I mean, we are so evolved past hostage negotiation. Heck, we're evolved past where we were a year ago. Yeah. All right. So what does this got to do with Taleb and anti-fragile? He wrote a book in 2012, which I just recently came across called anti-fragile. And he brings up this wacky idea. Not only is there post-traumatic stress trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, is post-traumatic stress growth. Mm. Like how does getting crushed by a meteor, you know, give you the opportunity to get up and be even stronger. Post-traumatic stress growth. I like that. Which very few people talk about, but what, you know, because it's not an effective teaching model. Yeah. You can't, you can't teach somebody by crushing them. But those that get crushed, the people that get back up. And the first case kidnapping that I worked, that where hostages get killed, I was, I just said to myself, we got to get better. We can't sit back and ever let this happen again. What do I got to do to get better? And so anytime anything went bad, then I said, we got to get better. The drive to get better and to learn from these things, I think, is what really made the difference. And that's how I dealt with it. You can wallow in your grief or you can use your grief to cause you to get up and get better. That makes sense. Um, okay, let's move into some easy tactics that we can learn uh, and I have a list of a few of them here that the listeners can learn and apply to their everyday lives. And uh, the first one is mirroring. And I'm, I'm curious, Chris, if you have a story maybe uh, that can sh you can share, which will explain the concept of mirroring. Yeah, mirroring is pretty much repeating uh, what somebody has just said word for word, anywhere from one to, one to five-ish words. Like, Technically, the hostage negotiator's mirror okay. is just to repeat the last three words of what someone has just said. Okay. What someone has just said, the last three words. The last three words. The last three words, exactly. Typically, with an upward inflection. Okay. And then once you've mastered that, now you can move it around. You can surgically mirror. Now, this is not the body language mirror. This is not mirroring their tone of voice or their, you know, if, they, if they're upset, you're upset. Nah, it's not that nonsense. It's repeating the last one to three-ish words, no more than five, sometimes about five, sometimes just one. So the first time I did this, I knew it as a hostage negotiator's mirror. You know, I'm in a Chase Manhattan bank robbery, uh, which I talk about in the book and which is highlighted in the master class. And the bank robber says something that so flummoxes me, like I'm startled by it. I just repeat what he just said. Now, he was a highly controlled negotiator. He is what I came to learn, uh, uh, used the technique of great, great CEOs. Always defer to people that are not on the phone, not in a room. Right. You know, great CEO is going to say, look, man, I got a board 
you know, I got a board of directors. I got to defer to the, I don't know what these guys are going to do. You know, they might even, they might even fire me if I make the wrong move. Yeah. Entrepreneurs say, oh, we got to check with our teams. Yeah. Same right. Thing. Right. Yeah. Well, you're talking to an important dude. If he's saying that guy or gal, who's really sharp because they're keeping from getting backed into a corner. Yeah. So this bank robber at the Chase Bank kept saying like, wow, these guys I'm with are so dangerous. Even I'm scared of them. I don't know what they're going to do. He was calling the shots the whole way. Uh -huh. But he was smart enough to stay completely in control. And if, if he acted like he was powerless, then we would never try to back him into a corner. It was, right. He was brilliant. So, you know, we had date him. I, he refused to give us his name. I confront him on his name. He starts talking about some van. And I had mentioned the van because that's how we got, got his name. And he says, well, you chased my driver away. And I said, we chased your driver away? <sighs> he said, yeah, when he saw the police, you cut and run. And so he's involuntarily blurting out information, giving us information right. about a bad guy that we didn't even know existed. And that's the great thing about the mirror. Like people start adding to what they just said. And even a, a very tightly controlled guy who's being careful about everything they say. So we're like, this is crazy. We got this guy to admit to stuff that led to the conviction of another bank robber who wasn't even at the scene. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, you know, the, uh, the investigators figured out what was going on while we're talking about this and went and got the guy and locked him up. <laughs> And this, this technique works in business elegantly. Yeah. And it just gets people to talk. And the one guy that we coach who's very high IQ, very high EQ. And I've noticed that mirroring people that are both high IQ and EQ love it because it's so effortless. Yeah. That's all he ever does. And he says every time the other side takes a position, whether it's a demand or it's a counteroffer, he just mirrors it. And then he does a read on their response and he knows whether or not they're bluffing or they're serious. Are they firm or is it soft? That's all he ever does is mirror. And he, and he loves it. It's so easy to apply too. you know, just the last three words of what everybody says, any, any conversation, you know, with their spouse, with your lover, uh, while you're negotiating, uh, with friends at dinner, you know, that's incredible. I love that. Okay. Um, the next uh, skill I want to talk about is uh, the different systems of thinking. Now, in the book, you talk about you have system one and system two. So system one right. is the thinking mind, very fast, instinct, instinctive, and emotional. And I'm a, ner uh, a brain science nerd. I've been nerding out on this stuff a long time. So, uh, you know, that comes from the reptilian brain, right, the, without being managed or without being kind of uh, regulated. And then we have system two of thinking, which is slow, deliberate deliberative and logical and right, right. um and there's a Kahneman good stuff uh, what stuff da danny Kahneman stuff that's out of danny Kahneman. Oh, okay fast and slow. Uh, yeah. I, yeah okay so there's a quote from from your book here and i really like it it says it it became clear if emotionally driven incidents not rational bargaining interactions constituted the bulk of what most police negotiators negotiators had to deal with then our negotiating skills had to laser focus on the animal the emotional and the irrational and could could we it evolve sounds like everyday life it, it sounds exactly <laughs> i mean shopping right is emotional we know this is is entrepreneurs buyers are emotional um yeah. they buy on emotion not logic um so do you have a story that we can we can apply to system one and system two thinking yeah and the, and the two are constantly intertwined right so you can't just rely upon one and there's, there's going to be points in time that you're going to want to sort of tactically move back and forth. I mean, you're going to want to you're, you're going to want to deactivate certain emotional thinking to get the in-depth thinking to p take place. Sometimes they don't have the capacity for in-depth thinking, and mm -hmm. you know you got to you got to come in come in a different way. Um, uh, some of the system two in-depth thinking, uh, what, what Brandon would term is forced empathy, like the classic phrase, "How am I supposed to do that?" You know, that's that's one of our first mm. versions of saying no. Well, what it is, is you're making the other side look at you. When you 
Okay, how am I supposed to do that? How The how question triggers in-depth thinking. And you cause this in-depth thinking from the other side. You make them take a look at your situation. Like that may be, it's the opening story and never split the difference. Right. And it worked in kidnappings. And um, we, 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 when we made the transition, the how question that we used was, how do we know that the hostage is alive? To get out of the old proof of life question, you know, mm-hmm. what is hostage at the time was this guy named uh, Pepe Escobar, Jose Escobar, really interesting entrepreneurial dude uh, who was building this ecotourism bu- business uh, in, ec- in Ecuador, which is there t- now. They, you know, they took a hiatus for a number of years. Okay. And he went back in and started his business up again. But we were like, how do we know? How do we know Pepe's alive? which causes in-depth thinking on the other side. They, they'd never been hit with that before. Mm-hmm. And we never had a single bad guy respond negatively to that. It always made him stop and think, which is what you're trying to get the other side to do. Yeah. Get him to stop and think and take stock of the situation. And Pepe told us afterwards, told me afterwards, when I went to interview him, he's like, yeah, it was crazy that you kidnapper and the negotiator was supposed to stay in town the whole time cut the deal and come back out in the jungle and report back to the boss what the deal was and the boss gives it a thumbs up or a thumbs down pretty much like every kind of business around the world right you know the point of contact cuts the deal takes it back to the boss and the boss says yeah we'll do it or no this stinks we're not doing it <laughs> he said but instead of that the guy kept coming back from town and all the kidnappers got together and huddled up and tried to decide whether or not to take Pepe to town and put him on the phone. And I'm like, holy cow. We disrupted their whole operation. Right. And they never did that before. They never, there never was that forced collaboration internally. And they didn't know that we were forcing them to do it. Now, Pepe, it ends up causing so much collaboration on their side. They relaxed. Pepe's, you know, got the bad guys on his side to lower their guard brilliant brilliant story he ends up escaping at two eight two o'clock in the morning in the middle of a driving rainstorm mm-hmm. and and i remember you know i never found out you know my proof of life i was trying to get him on the phone they never put him on the phone so you know i i blew up to upstate new york to talk to him mostly to find out you know what happened to my strategy getting him on the phone he's like yeah they talked about it the whole time i just escaped before they did it <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, um and you mentioned empathy in this story, but you highlight in the book tactical empathy and I think it's important because um you know, it's 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 a bit of a buzzword nowadays, but business back in the day didn't really understand empathy as much as business people do nowadays and the importance of it. And um can you can you tell us a bit more what tactical empathy is and how we could use it? in everyday business yeah well um empathy is just you know for for the negotiator empathy is demonstrating understanding of the other side's position you know um very close to daniel goldman's book focus talks about three kinds of empathy and one of them he refers to is cognitive empathy which is just verbally telling the other person what you understand facts and emotions critical issue okay You know, and then the reason why, while I was still with the FBI, I started to collaborate with Harvard because Bob Manukin wrote a book with still the best chapter on empathy I have ever read called The Tension Between Empathy and Assertiveness. It's in his book Beyond Winning. And in it, he says empathy is not agreeing or even liking the other side. Okay. Like it is not sympathy. It is not agreement. It is not liking. It's just demonstrating, articulating back to them what you believe their perspective is. Not what it should be. What it is. Okay. Um, you mentioned you mentioned Kotler earlier. You know, yeah. Kotler in one of his books said, "Empathy is about the transmission of information. Compassion is the reaction okay. to the transmission." So empathy is just the effective transmission of you, what you believe the other side 
thinks, feels, how they see it. That's a very narrow definition of empathy. Let's call it the negotiator's definition. Okay. And tactical, what is that about? Well, as you well know, you know, you said you're a st student of brain science. Like we are, have access to data now, neuroscience, which is a hard science, mm -hmm. versus the soft science of psychology. Okay. So you take you take what we've learned. We, you know, I flatter myself by including <laughs> myself in a collective body. You know how the brain actually works chem chemically, neurosynaptic connections. The brain is negative. The amygdala, the limbic system, survival mode. Is negative. Seventy-five percent is is our swag. Scientific wild ass guess. Negative reactions and thought processes. Yeah. Because yeah. negative keeps you alive. Okay. Which is what we inherited from the caveman. The, the pessimistic caveman lived. The optimistic caveman says that saber toothed tiger just needs a hug. And yeah, <laughs> All they need is love, right? <laughs> All they need is love. So we've inherited this wiring. If you're human, you have it. Period. Mm -hmm. Regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion, geography, diet, anything. So if it's 75% negative, now the next thing from neuroscience, which they've shown over and over again, simply calling out negative thoughts diminishes them. Period. Mm -hmm. The degree of diminishment varies. But calling them out, calling out the elephant in the room, not denying the elephant in the room, diminishes it. So tactically, if I know that you're 75% negative, and tactically, if I know that simply calling out the negatives is the best and most effective and durable way to diffuse them, then tactically, I'm going to start out by saying, look, you probably already think I'm greedy. Mm -hmm. Or you've seen people like me before, and you don't trust them. So consequently, I haven't earned your trust yet. Or then what we in the black swan method we've been like let's get a little crazy let's get proactive what happens if we call out a negative before it exists do we speak it into existence or do we inoculate right and i you know i found out the hard way when i'm working kidnappings and i roll into an american embassy overseas who views me as an intruder views me as this guy from D.C. is only here because D.C. thinks we're not doing our jobs. Right. So anytime I open my mouth, they're going to, even if I say hello, they're going to say, what do you mean by that? That sounds critical. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that before I ever opened my mouth, I would say this is going to sound harsh. And that would deactivate, inoculate from their negative reaction. Oh, nice. And so we just, in the Black Swan Method, we have upped the level to such a degree. You know, my team and Brandon really leading the way in our, in our business negotiations. We got a whole system called the Accusations Audit. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to call out a whole bunch of things. You probably think I'm greedy. You probably think I'm selfish. You're probably wondering. You're probably asking yourself right now why you even took this meeting. And you're probably thinking this is going to be a waste of your time. Yeah. Now I'm, now I'm free to plow ahead. Nice. I guess it kind of opens them up to, it, it prepares them, right? It feels like it's empathy to prepare them for what they think may be the worst. A tremendous aspect of that is preparing them. And people are ridiculously resilient if you've given them a chance to prepare. Oh, wow. I love that. Okay. Okay. Another really uh, a thing that shocked me. Um, one thing that you highlighted in the book is that you guys quite often strive to get a no answer yeah. before you get an S. Uh, yes. And so traditional, like I started off my career in sales um, with a sales script and it was hard sales selling mortgages. And, uh, you know, we wanted to get multiple yeses and repetition of yeses and never have I ever learned anywhere that uh, no should come first? And um, I'm wondering if you have a story that you can kind of maybe share, well, share, share with us why no is so important and it may be a story uh, on top of that. Yeah, well, what, you know, what you're talking about, unfortunately, the, the pro proliferation of that approach 
globally for for good and evil, you know, uh-huh. good purposes and bad purposes. Yeah. You know, a lot of the bamboozlers out there, like, you know, let me get some yes momentum going. Right. You know, I, you know, uh, um, I, I could name industries that are famous for getting people into bad deals. Right. Via the yes momentum. So it's it's proliferated to such a degree. There ain't a human being on earth that hasn't been bamboozled by it. <laughs> you know, and if you're a legitimate person, you're saying like, I'm not a bamboozler, you know, so I can do it. Well, no, you can't. Right. This is a problem. Human beings are yes battered. Yes battered. So what do battered children do when an adult raises their arms to them? Guards themselves. Not as in it. They, 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 they flinch, themselves. they duck, you know, yeah. they, they, get, they get back, they withdraw. Now, you as an adult, my, you might know that neurologically, a genuine warm embrace actually heals people. Right. It helps them. So you can say, well, my intention was not to batter, my intention was to heal. It don't matter. That battered child's already been damaged. You know, they're going to flinch no matter what you do, no matter how good you are. Mm-hmm. So the world is yes, battered. Just because your intentions are good doesn't change the fact that if whoever you're dealing with is older than 15 years old, they've already been bamboozled by the yes moment. They've been <laughs> back. <Okay. laughs> so first of all, if you, if you uh, Black Swan Group, we are out of the yes business. If we teach you the Black Swan method, you will be out of the yes business. You can't, you, you know, you have to recognize the world is yes battered. So to get out of it to begin with, like Jim Camp's book, Start With No, was in 2002, was about getting out of yes entirely. Right. Or letting people know that they're free to say no. So what, what do we do in a black swan group? What happens if we get people to say no? What kind of an effect does that have? And then we realize that people feel safe and protected when they feel say no. Mm-hmm. That's why people are in, in no mode, you know, like, and it, this is so stupid. Like one, one client emails me and says, you know, the other side's in no mode. No matter what we say, they say no. I'm like, awesome. Change your questions. Right. <laughs> Instead of, do you agree? Go to, do you disagree? Instead of, do you still want to do this? Have you given up on this? Mm. Instead of, is this a good idea? Say, is this a ridiculous idea? Then the, now, first of all, this is so powerful that this, some people, this is the only technique that they learn, get out of the yes business, get into the no business. And they start so slaughtering their counterparts, Mm -hmm. you know, the people within their company they're competing with, not the people on the other side, but a salesperson learns how to only ask no oriented questions. He starts outpacing everybody in his company, he or she, and they're like, you know, I should work for you. They, they email me. They say, I should work for you. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm glad that you're, you know, you're, you're the top performer now in your business because of this. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to close Robert Herjavec a number of years ago. I've offered him a free ticket to our training. He's offered to buy several more. We can't pin him down on the number. At 5.03 in the afternoon, I sent him an email. Is it a ridiculous idea for you to commit to three tickets now? Are you against paying for them before the business day starts in New York tomorrow? We're both in L.A. We're three hours behind the clock. Brandon has called me on the phone and said, close Herjavec now. Because before the sun comes up tomorrow, the event's going to be sold out. He's not getting anything. Right. So I sent him the email at 5.03. When's the last time you tried to close somebody at 5.03? Via email. Via two lines, both no oriented questions. Right. I get a re- commit, full commitment response back one minute later, 5.04. No, we got no problem committing to three now. No, my assistant will get back to you within the hour. We'll settle it now. They had paid at 5.23. I got the email confirmation they paid. Nice. I love that. 
I um, actually use that method uh, in, I, I, I'm working to create an event here soon, actually a, like a brain optimization event. And um, we hadn't heard from the neuroscientist in, in about a month. Uh, briefly, he just kept saying, uh, I'll get to it, you know, I'll get to it. And he said, I get to it to this date and he didn't hear anything, get to it to this date. And, um, out, I took a line out of your book and I said, uh, I think, I believe it was, are you still committed to this project? Question mark or, or something along the lines. And immediately, like he got back within the hour and he said, yep, we're going to do it. And the next day he had a whole, pro the whole project, the whole, everything lined out what we were looking for. So it works and it worked well. So it's great stuff. Um, we're going to soon, we're going to jump into questions from the audience, but before we do, we need to define and Am I going to uh, get heckled. Are they going to be nice? They're, they're going to depends. I know some of them are kind of <laughs> jerks, but we'll see. <laughs> Actually, all of them. I'm uh, fragile. Uh, yeah, you seem like it. Um, all of them, <laughs> all of them were in Las Vegas with me doing stunt airplanes uh, recently. So they, uh, if they've sobered up from that, then I think they'll be okay. Um, right. um, so uh, okay, so the Black Swan uh, theory, the Black Swan, what you named your company after, and what you've used uh, for negotiation is is the the unknown in any situation going into a situation and not expecting it to unfold like it normally does is that correct yeah well it's anticipating surprises anticipating really surprises okay. okay um do we have a do you have a good good uh, elaborate on that just a little bit more for us well there's always things you don't know i mean it's just uh, I could get into an elaborate intellectual explanation. It's an asymmetric world. You're always hiding things, which means they're always hiding things. You know, there's, there's always things, there's always things, you, there's always a way to make a better deal for both sides. Right. And, uh, you know, we just did a two day training in LA. And it was cool because we did this exercise that is group negotiations, team on team. And everybody thinks they're a great negotiator. It helps them on, understand how much they're not taking into account okay and and the real issue is who do i want to be in the world when this is all over so one of our attendees is getting ready to buy a house uh it's been on, in in la it's been on the market for 200 days when most houses are on the market for six days mm -hmm. the problem is there's a hoarder next door mm. and 91 year old guy and um it's the house next door is a disaster. And that's why nobody's going to buy this place. Now, there's a fence that obscures a view. This guy's going to buy the house because he's like, both the city is working on straightening out this hoarder. And um, he's 91. I mean, he ain't going to be there that much longer anyway. So, you know, let me, let me, let me gamble on this. I can, the fence is there. I can, I can put up with having him next door. So they got a deal, and he finds out the fence got to come down. Fence is a violation of local code. City's been waiting for the house to change hands. They're gonna they're gonna reduce its height, which now is gonna give him full vision of the hoarder, which is a nightmare. And the hoarder on his, on his property line's got an ugly chain link fence, okay, which is even higher. And so he talks to me in the afternoon. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get him to knock 40 grand off the house. How can you help me, you know, drop the price? Now, I'm not enthusiastic about dropping a price because it's not making it a better deal. You know, most people think, well, a lousy deal will be less palatable if it's more financially rewarding. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It, a bad deal just costs you less. It's still a bad deal. So terms are always a key. So we put him through this exercise and he says to himself, who do I want to be? You know, when I buy this house, these people are still going to be in the neighborhood. Our kids are going to go to school together. Am I going to be the jerk to beat them out of another 40 grand over circumstances they couldn't control? Mm -hmm. So he goes and he starts talking to him. And because he cared about who he was going to be, he says, I, I, I got this crazy idea. What if you guys go to the hoarder and offer to rebuild his fence for him at the height that he has it, which is higher. You pay for it. You put in this gorgeous wooden fence, nice side to this direction. But then 
you you fix this. And he says the wife of the couple started to cry because she thought he was going to cancel the deal. Mm -hmm. Now, he could have got $40,000 off the house, but it still wouldn't have fixed any of the problems. Right. Instead, a, a new idea came up to him where less money was on the table. He gets a better fence than he could have got him in the first place. The sellers can go to this guy because they've lived next door to him. They have a relationship with him, something he could never do. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do this on his behalf unless it saves a deal for them. They're, and they're wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully relieved. And he comes back the next day and he's like, you know, I, I never – it never would have occurred to me to ask myself, who am I going to be when this is all over? And because he cared about who he was going to be, his reputation in the community, he got a better deal than he ever could have got. <laughs> and it cost everybody less money. It's fantastic. Okay. Let's move in to questions from the audience. I think Ray put one up first. Ray, go ahead and turn your microphone on in your video and... Rock on. Hey, Chris. Big How fan. You doing, um, did, did you pass out or did you puke in the dogfight? Which one? I was proud to say I did not fall into either one of those categories. So that made me a winner for the day, I think. You know, not puking Excellent. or passing out, even though I almost passed out. So huge fan of your book. Uh, I remember reading it a few years ago and actually using some of the techniques on my wife. But I made the mistake of, mistake of then recommending your book to my wife. And she came back to me and she's like, wait a minute. Have you been doing this for the last few months? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I actually have. So that, and that it kind of backfired on me. Uh, my question for you is, so I run a number of companies and I have teams all over the world. And the biggest challenge that I find as the CEO of these companies is negotiating cultural differences. In fact, just this morning, I had to do something like that. When people on the team are from different parts of the world and they're trying to communicate with each other and they think they're being clear, but right. just that the way that one side takes it, the other side communicates it, because of those cultural differences, the interpretation is really off. And I feel like I act as a moderator. I've had the privilege of living around the world, so I feel I can moderate those things. But that's not a magic bullet. It feels like I'm putting out fires all the time. Do you have any advice when you're kind of negotiating across kind of cultural boundaries? What can you do to kind of ease things over? Yeah. Okay. So let, let's talk about culture in two different ways. The culture that we think is there and the culture that's really there. Um, we think, we think the culture that's there has to do with geography, ethnicity, religion, whatever, you know, the stuff that's layered on top of who we are as human beings. The first culture that everybody is is human human culture and how we're wired neuroscience wise it's a uh, limbic system which is your emotional wiring is very much like the respiratory system in a lot of ways a paramedic is going to be able to work on you whether you're chinese pakistani latino african because the wiring respiratory wise circulatory wise is there as humans same with the limbic system People run across cultural differences when they're communicating based on what they see their culture as versus adapting and confirming understanding of the other side, which is what tactical empathy is. And, and one of the reasons, besides the fact that I know that this, the Black Swan method works globally, other than the fact that it's selling very well in over 36 countries, I just get back from Dubai. And I get women in particular walking up to me from China saying, I'm using a black swan method in China. I'm killing it. Another woman walks up to me in Pakistan. I'm using a black swan method in Pakistan. Another, a guy from India. I'm using it in India. No oriented questions. Work globally. So if you're trying to focusing on demonstrating understanding the other side, then the rest of this falls away. You run into culture problems when like, I'm an American. This is the way Amer we Americans do it. You know, and, and, and you're trying to push your culture onto the other side. Now, so that's the perceived culture, the real culture. Globally, human, human, humanity breaks into three type, tribes, assertives, analysts, accommodators, fight, flight, make friends. The cavemen that survived from the caveman days. We pulled people globally and know this to be true. I've taught in China. I've taught Indians. Uh... International business schools are people from all over the world, India, Pakistan, China, come to U.S. business schools and they go back to their countries with these techniques. So I know 
based on testing, fight, flight, make friends. The world splits up evenly into these tribes. Now, how does this break down? That's when the same words have different meanings or the same actions have different meanings. If you're focusing on making friends and you go silent, you go silent to signal fury. And so projection bias, if the other side goes silent, they must be mad. Now, the analyst goes silent because they want to think. Like an analyst, you ask an analyst a question, they want to think about it for 36 hours before they answer you. So imagine the analyst and the accommodator negotiate. The analyst is going silent because he really appreciates what the other side has said, he or she, and they want to think about it. The accommodator, the relationship-oriented person, is going like, oh, my God, he's silent. He must be angry. i got to talk some more. <laughs> That's actually exactly what happened this morning. That's why I'm laughing. Those, that, that seems like the situation. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the, the real culture class is a clash is among the three types, the three tribes. And this two-day school that I was just talking about that we just did in L.A., the second day, we planned on spending three hours on the three types, and we spent five on the three types because none of the business people there had ever occurred to them that the three types existed. And we busted them up into groups, and then not only do they see it exists, I mean, they all have names for the other side. They didn't know that they were calling each other. Like the analysts love to say to the assertives, why do it right when you can do it wrong now? Because an assertive wants to do it now. And, and it's, it's hysterical. And then, then you see the light bulbs turn on over, over each other's heads. They're like, holy cow, you know, I had no idea that this was, this was the, the tight mismatch. So it's, it's not the culture mismatch that most people think. It's the tight mismatch. And then when you know that, then then we, especially at impasse that you see it at impasse and then if you understand it's a tight mismatch then you can fix it nice nice and i'm assuming in the show notes we'll have more information on where i can find much more information about all this of course we, will. we got we've, we've got a free a publication on our website on the three types black swan ltd.com we got a bunch of free stuff and understanding the types is so important that, that we got a free ebook on the three types awesome thanks chris Thanks, Ray. Uh, Tim, come in and uh, shoot a question to Chris. Hey, Chris. Love, love your book, and I love the way you think differently, and a lot of your advice doesn't Thanks, line Tim. up with the stereotypical stuff, and uh, I, I love it. You seem like somebody that, that loves to grow and learn. You've talked about all these books that you've been reading, so I'm curious, what's something that you've learned recently that you wish you knew a decade ago? Wow. Well, I'm learning so much stuff on a regular basis, you know, that I, I feel like I'm smarter than I was a year ago. Um, recent, in, you know, uh, we're still elevating the black swan method. And we realize now that, you know, we teach four ways to say no. And in digging into it deeper, among dealing with people that are difficult. Like about a year and a half ago, we just decided to write people that are difficult off entirely. You know, uh, a friend of mine, Joe Polish, runs an organization called Genius Network, and Joe, Joe's come up with two concepts that are elf and half. You got two kinds of people you're dealing with. Elf are easy, lucrative, and fun. Ha uh, half is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And Avoid the halves to deal with the elves. How do you smoke them out? How do you, how, how do you recognize them so that the elves don't suck the life out of you? And so we started to more fully adapt the, uh, about a year and a half ago, probably. Just like, if you're a half, we're not going to do business with you. And just recently, we began experimenting with techniques because sometimes people are half in behavior, but not in who they are. So how do we say no to the behavior and not say no to the person? How do we say no to the terms without saying no to the person? And so now we're using the, the black swan method skills 
basically to, to gently fire a warning shot at the halves and give them an opportunity to straighten up. Our director of business development, Davey Johnson, does this on a regular basis. And she says, you know, well, you know, people are puppies. And you don't get mad at a puppy for bad behavior, but you do find a way to correct the behavior. And so we're very much into giving people an opportunity to convert themselves from a half to an elf. What's a typical behavior? The person who asks for free stuff after the deal is cut. Like that's taught as a negotiation method. The first time I heard it, Roger Dawson's power negotiations from the 1980s. You know, like if you cut a deal on a suit and you get a tailored suit, as the guy's measuring you, look at him and say, so how many free ties do I get? <laughs> you know, so people are doing that. It's called scope creep. People do that in business all the time. So we devised a method, to one of several, to deal with scope creep. Davey hits his customer with it the other day who can, who's continued to ask for free add-ons. And she hits him with um, an iMessage. And he's like, oh, okay. And he stopped doing it on the spot. So how we're converting people from half to elves now is, is I think, um, extremely useful. And it keeps people from walking away from customers that they didn't have to. Or, you know, everybody's got customers they feel they can't walk away from. I don't care who you are. I guarantee you, you're continuing to deal with people that are halves, or you might say they're Peters, pain in the aardvark. And I, and I had a successful business guy telling me the other day, yeah, it was a referral from a, a trusted friend. I had to take care of him. This guy was a major pain in the neck. I wish I'd have known this sooner because I didn't know how to get him to stop. So we're very much into that these days. How do you say no to the behavior and not the person? Yeah, that, that sounds super interesting. So you're having good success with that? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I'm astonished at its effectiveness. And I would have, and then it makes all the sense in the world because there's a lot of bad business behavior that people just don't know any better, like puppies. You know, they, they think, all right, so it's okay to ask for free stuff after I've cut the deal. You know, they're not a bad so person, you, but they've gotten bad advice and they're doing it. So you left us hanging with that iMessage, the person who asked for free stuff, like how did your biz dev guy respond to that? What, what came next? Uh, they, they they were like, look, when when you continue to ask for free stuff after we've cut the deal, I get concerned because I think it's going to keep us from having a healthy business relationship. Mm -hmm. And and there, there's there's a whole bunch of nuances to the each and every word there is selected, and there's a strategic reason for all of that, which appears to violate some of the stuff that you learn in the in the more fundamental aspects of the Black Swan method, and the guy just went, oh, and stop. Wow. Awesome. Worth the price of admission. Thanks. <laughs> Chris, uh, hey, guys, we got to wrap up. Chris, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your wisdom with, with us. I really appreciate your time. Um, if the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on, maybe your master class uh, events you have coming up, where's the best place they can they can do that at? absolute best thing to do is to subscribe to the newsletter um if you're in the u.s text to sign up function you can text to the number 33 triple seven that's three three seven 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 send black swan method three words spaces between the words not cap sensitive to 33 triple seven we'll ask for your email you sign up for the newsletter the newsletter is concise and actionable it comes in on tuesday mornings it's one article. It ain't like seven articles you don't know what to read. It's one concise, actionable article. It's the gateway to the website, training announcements, new course announcements, whatever we have going on will then come with the newsletter. You have the option to look at that or not. Otherwise, read it. Use it to raise the level of your game today and just keep getting better. 
I love it, Chris. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this this episode. And uh, you guys go out and get the book, Never Split the Difference. Hopefully one day they'll make a movie about your life, Chris, and, and we can put all the principles in the movie too. Um, but I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, my friend. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.